Okay, so last time we concluded uh, with the snake lemma. Uh, since you're already familiar with it, we skipped the proof. And so we talked about, the last time we talked about differential, the differential, like the application D, the external differential. And we talked about uh, um, cohomological complexes in general and how you can form a cohomology out of it, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so now we'll apply this to things to define the, the RAM cohomology, which is a cohomology you should already be familiar with. Uh, but let's see it from this, uh, let's say, cohomological complex, complex as point of view. So, start with the manifold of dimension M. And now we know, I mean, we know from before, it was a lemma that if you compose two differentials on different levels, and usually we just call it D and we think of this as D squared, even if of course the domains are different, uh, then the sequence of uh, abelian groups Et cetera, et cetera, is a cohomological complex. And remember that we, th this symbol here denoted all possible P forms on M. So sections of the external power bundle of degree P. And uh, it's cohomology. So this is a cohomological complex. So we saw that you can associate a cohomology to it. Sorry, without the apostrophe. It's cohomology is the the RAM cohomology of M. And we write H, the dot stands for the right order, the right degree. And here we have dr of m. Okay. So explicitly, we have uh, the set of closed forms of degree p. So the ones which get mapped to zero, the ones in the kernel of D. And then we have the image. And these are exact. Now we know of course that the um, since this is a cohomological complex, every exact form is also closed. So we can form the cohomology HP, PR, M, and this is ZP, modulus BP. And this is the P, the RAM cohomology group. Homology group. So this is not only uh, an abelian group, it's also a vector space. And remember that when P is equal to zero, this quotient is not there. Um, so dr zero is precisely just functions such that its differential is zero. So these are locally constant functions. And what does it mean locally constant? It means constant on each connected component okay. to be continuous. Okay. 
so in particular, each constant gives you a factor here. So each connected component gives you a factor. So you just take the direct sum of R's where M, M is the number of connected components. Of M, of course. So in each of them, you're going to assign a different uh, constant. So that's why you have R M times. Of course, this you can think of it just as R to the M or the product of you know, um, M, uh, R M times with itself, uh, but we write the sum because we still think of them as groups, like a billion groups. So we like to use the sum. Uh, one other thing we know for sure is that if you if your degree P goes higher than the dimension of the manifold, then you get zero. And this is because the bundle itself is zero. This is a trivial bundle. So let me actually write it more like this. I mean, it's it's less than a trivial bundle. It's, I mean, it's a very trivial bundle, and a trivial bundle of rank zero. So in particular, there is no sections. I mean, there is only one section, which is closed exact, whatever you want. And um, OK, so now let's define also a way to see all of this together. Because we know that if you have two forms, even of different degrees, you can take the wedge product between them. So if we put a star here, instead of a dot or a P, what we mean is that you're taking all of this together. And now this is an algebra in the sense that, okay, the sum is just the usual sum of forms, but we also have a product, which is the wedge product. So if we take the equivalent class of uh, omega and the equivalent class of omega prime, you see that the product is the equivalent class of omega wedge omega prime. And it is well defined since uh, um, if you take omega plus d theta wedge omega prime. So we have to prove that, I mean, these are equivalent classes. So you have to show that the um the class doesn't change if you change the representatives okay so we have omega wedge omega prime which we had like and then we have d omega wedge omega prime uh but this part here so maybe i'm gonna use a different color this part here uh, is the same as d of omega wedge of omega prime because this is this part which okay it's what we want and then you have, uh, what is it, minus plus, minus one to some degree. Okay, let's just put P and it's the degree of omega, oh, of theta. Um, and then you have theta wedge the omega prime. But remember that omega prime is a representative for a Durham class, so in particular it's close. So this is zero. So this is in fact omega wedge omega prime plus the differential of something. Hence, this, uh, these are the same. No? So in particular, uh, omega with omega prime is the same as omega plus plus d theta with omega prime. Yeah, these are the same. Because they only differ by an exact form. Mm, we mentioned that uh, if you have a function, smooth, same with f from m to n, smooth, we know that uh, the pullback of a form along this function commutes with the differential operator. Yeah? 
So in particular, this is what we defined as um, morphism between uh, cohomological complexes, this F star, because it goes at every level and it commutes with the operators defining the complex. And um, this implies, of course, that we do get something induced in cohomology uh, because of this. So we have an induced mapping cohomology. Yeah. And of course, if uh, F is a different morphism, diff morphism. F star is an isomorphism at every level for every p. So it's an isomorphism of cohomological complexes. And this is just an observation because simply if F is a different morphism, then it's as an inverse. And if you take the star of that inverse, that is the inverse of your F star. Okay, so now we know what is the um, the RAM complex. So let's try to compute it for some particular cases. So the most basic case, so-called Poincaré lemma, is that if u in Rn is start-like and open, then its cohomology is trivial. Of course, not the zero cohomology. Uh, the zero cohomologies are because this is star-like implies only one connected component. So star-like, if you don't know, it means that there is a point such that everything can be connected to that point to a straight line containing you. Okay, so how do we prove this? Um, the idea is to basically construct uh, an inverse of the differential operator. Okay, so we want to define k. Oh, sorry, it's a lambda. So this one goes down, yeah. So, and what we want to it. Well, normally to have an inverse, you want something like decompose k equal identity, but we cannot expect that, that's too strong. So we ask decompose k plus k compose d is identity. And um, this might look a bit weird. Uh, so how does this help us? So before we prove the existence of this k, let's see how it helps us. So suppose we have k, we have such k, and now we take a closed form, because remember this k we're defining it on every q form, but what we're really, when we want to compute the cohomology, we only care about closed forms. And this is where you see that this k composed d will disappear, but let's do it slowly. So we see omega, you can think of this as the identity applied to omega. So it's the same as d compose k of omega. So it's a d of k omega uh, plus k of d omega. Okay. Uh, but now this is zero. Because we are taking a closed form this time. So this is d of k omega and um, um this, the omega we started with is not only close, but it's also exact. 
And if every closed form is exact, it means that your cohomology is zero. So here, uh, maybe the only thing I should have said, okay, the omega is zero, but who is telling me that K of the omega is zero? And maybe I should have said that here we want linear. Okay, so let's define K. Um, so the idea is to define it only on simple forms and then extend by linearity. So, oh, took the eraser, I guess. So defining, okay. So we take omega to be something like f of x time just uh, dx1 wedge 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 dx2. Actually, uh, sorry, my bad. Let's put uh, just arbitrary indexes for now, still. I mean, because this is a basis, so I won't really want to define it on the basis. Then maybe we do the computations with this particular one. Okay, so we know that this is a basis. All the elements of this form are a basis. to take one less or equal than i1, less than i2, less than iq, which is less or equal than i. Yeah, we know that this is a, a basis for this um, space of sections and you just have to multiply by a function. So every possible omega in uh, lambda q of u is a linear combination of elements of this form, okay? But since our k is gonna be linear, I just need to, to define k on objects of this form and everything else is by linearity. So let's define it here. So k of such a omega, no, since I've already above, I can just write k of omega. By definition is the integral from zero to one of t to the q minus one of f of tx in dt. And uh, first of all, before it's not over. Actually, yeah, let's write everything and then explain what it is and why this is okay. So then you have the sum from j equal one to q of negative one to the j minus one of x i j d x i one wedge. Then you skip the jth one, you skip it. And then you continue with the other. Okay. So it's linear. I mean, it's linear by definition because we're just defining on a basis and say we send it by linearity. Um, I guess the only thing we should have checked is that sense zero is zero, but it does. Yeah. I mean, it's linear enough. We have to check that it's linear enough. So it is. Uh, it does indeed go from Q to Q minus one because we are always eliminating one thing here. And it is well defined because the integral is from zero and one. And the only place where it could not be defined is this if f is not defined on tx. And the reason that f is defined on tx is that is defining, oh yeah, maybe I should have said, uh, we're, we're assuming that uh, u, u is start like with respect to zero. Are light with respect to zero. Even if, if it's not respect to zero, we just translate everything and assume respect to zero. Um, so now this tx is the segment connecting zero to x. So in particular, is in u. So f is defined on this, so we can integrate. So this is all well defined. What we need to do, of course, is check that it in fact does have this property here. Okay, so let's do that. And again, we only need to check it on this uh, simple forms. So let's just do it on one simple form. This is fx dx1 wedge wedge dxq. Okay, I'm not gonna 
do it with arbitrary indexes, just the first few indexes. Okay, so this is the differential of k of this. So let's write down this again. The integral between 0 and 1, t q minus 1, f of t x in dt times the sum from j from 1 to q, negative 1 to the j minus 1, um, x j, dx1, wedge, you skip the jth one, and then you go all the way to q. Okay, so let's take differential of this. We know how to do it. So first of all, we take the differential of the integral part times this object. And um, you see, when you have something like this, you know, the we're derivating with respect to x, right? I mean, with respect to, let's say, x1, then x2, then x3, but let's say with respect to x. So you can just uh, take, this is all nice and compact intervals, the functions are smooth, uh, so you can just bring the derivation inside. Okay. Uh, so the differential of this object in particular becomes the sum from j equal 1 to n of the integral from 0, 1 to q minus 1. Uh, sorry, not q minus 1, but q. Then here you have the derivative of f with respect to xj evaluated at tx in dt in the xj. So you think of, let's say, of this here as a function with respect to x. This is just a function with respect to x. And then you have a one form, because this is a function, you take the derivative, you get a one form. Wedge this, whatever that is, j from one to q minus one, j minus one, x to the j, dx one, wedge, you skip the j, and you go all the way to xq plus. So now we had the derivative of this times this. And now we have to take the derivative this times the derivative of this, right? And this we're going to separate into two parts. So th this one I want to separate it into um, the ones up to q and the ones above q. So you have okay the ones on the left stays the same. Q minus one f tx dt. Okay, when you take the derivative here of the first ones, so if, um, yeah, when you take the differential with respect to one of this, uh, actually, no, sorry, uh, this is something I want to do later. Um, yeah, I mean, when you take the derivative of one specific one of this component with respect to x j, this minus one to the j minus one disappears because you have to bring this dxj all the way here. Okay, and how many times are you doing this? You're doing this exactly q times. So this is times q, dx one wedge wedge dxq. And now this part is the coefficient up to here, and this part is the q form, let's say part. Okay, so maybe I'll explain the, this part again. If you derive this thing with respect to, let's say, to x1, the first term of this sum becomes simply dx1 wedge dxq, you know, all the way. And the second term is just annihilated, and the third term is annihilated, and the fourth, all of them are annihilated. Okay, then we derive respect to x2, same thing. And you do this q times, so you get a q here. And now this thing is uh, rather nice because you see this q times t to the q minus 1 looks very much like something we want to integrate by parts. OK, so let's do that. So I'll write this one later. I'm not going to use colors. So you are the orange part. So if we integrate this by parts, uh, what you get is f of x minus the integral between 0 and 1 of t to the q times the sum from j equal 1 to n of xj d 
in dxj sorry, this is of f evaluated in tx dt and all of this in dx1 watch watch dx okay so now we're integrating in uh, by parts with respect to t okay So this would be the evaluation of, uh, maybe I'll write it somewhere. So the primitive would be t to the q times f of the x. So this is the common primitive. So when you evaluate it at zero, this is zero. When you evaluate it at one, this is f. So this is evaluation of one minus evaluation of zero, this f of x. And then you have equal to the integral of the derivative. So you have, when you derive respect to, do uh, you derive the first factor, you get Q times T to the Q minus one. When you derive the second factor, you get T to the Q and here you have to take the gradient, yeah? This part, because we are deriving respect to T. Okay. And now we're kind of very close, because if you look back up here, Right, this kind of look very similar. If you bring this xj inside, maybe something good will happen. Um, okay, so this was the orange part. So this is to say that this come from each other. And now let's see what happens here. So now I wanna, so plus, plus. Uh, now I wanna separate the first sum here. Uh, up to j and then from j on. Uh, sorry, up to q and then from q on. So this is the sum from j equal one to n and I just wanna kind of glue together the parts up to q and then the rest. So the interesting part here is that if uh, this j is between one and q, when you take this wedge product, there's only one term which survives, right? Because uh, if, if, I mean, if this J is the same as this J, then it survives. If this J is different than this J, then the XJ wedge something which contains the XJ is at zero. So that's why I want to separate. And here we get a sum from I equal one to Q. And we just put them together, assuming that the two J's are just I. So we had the integral from zero to one of t to the q times xi d in dxi f dx dx1 wedge wedge dx q. And again, the negative sign disappears because you have to bring this dxi to the correct position. Yeah. And yeah, since here we're integrating with respect to t, you can bring the xi inside. So just it, okay. Uh, but for the other part, then we get something different. So plus. Where was I? Yeah. And then we have to look at the, yeah, everything else that's above. So above is j greater than q and integral from zero one dq df dxj. Here we don't change anything, we just copy. Wedge. Because now things don't cancel out, we don't really have a good way to write this. I just write it as it was. So these two parts together give you this. Okay. Okay, so this is D compose K. Now let's compute K compose D and hope that things cancel out basically. That's what we're asking, yeah? Mm. 
did I write this? Okay, actually, we can simplify this once more. Because uh, you see, actually, th these two are the same. Only, of course, the index is different. But these two are the same thing, just with a minus sign in front. Okay. So this is just the sum from uh, j greater than q of these objects. Uh, but I will leave it like this. So just to not take you know another page, just to write this little thing. Because uh, on the other page, I want to compute k compose d of the same thing. So let's compute k compose d of the same thing. So f of x, uh, dx1, wedge, wedge, dxq. OK, so now we have to take the differential. So you have k, and here you have the sum. And you see the all the terms uh, from 1 to q actually disappear. So the sum is only from j greater than q to n of df in dxj, x. And OK, I could bring this dxj somewhere, but I'm just going to leave it in front. OK, and remember, this j is greater than q, because if j is less or equal to q, then here you would have a repetition of differentials, and this would be 0. OK, now we need to apply k to it. Yeah. So k is linear by definition. So the sum can go outside. And then we simplify the integral from 0 to 1 of dq. Uh, sorry, here you have the differential. So my f now is the derivative instead. And observe that before we had the q minus 1 here. So you might be like, oh, wait, there we should have q minus 1, right? By the way, we defined it. But remember that q is the degree of the form. And now we're applying k to a q plus 1 form. This is a q plus 1 form. So this is q plus 1 minus 1, so it's q. Uh-huh. And where was I? OK, dt. And OK, so you could think of this as the coefficient. And then remember, there was this funny thing with the differential. OK, the first one becomes just dxj times dx1, which is dx dxq. And then when you apply it to these other ones, you have the sum from 1 to q of negative 1 to the i, xi. And then you get dxj, wedge dx1. You exclude the ith term. And then you go all the way to q. Oof, sorry. I'll rewrite this uh, with a better space economy. So here's q plus sum from i equal 1 to q minus 1 to the i xi dxj wedge dx1. Then you exclude the ith term, and then you go all the way to dxq. Okay, this is just the definition of q. This is really, uh, sorry, of, q, of uh, k. This is just the definition of k. If you look back at how we define k, yeah, you simply have to take each term here and convert it, let's say, from a differential of the coordinate function to just the coordinate function, and put the correct uh, negative one in front. So that's simply what we did. Uh, the interesting thing here, yeah, is this, you have this special term, let's say, and then you have all these complicated terms. OK, uh, so we have an expression for <clears throat> d compose k, and we have an expression for k compose d. So I'm, I'm basically going to rewrite decompose k here. So this is f of x. Minus, and remember here, this was the simplification, which I skipped before. So sorry, plus. No, wait, was it minus or plus? Uh, it's minus. the sum from j greater than q 
length to n. Yeah, because this to simplify. No, sorry, it was this two that simplified. My bad. Sorry. Ah, oh, wait. I can do this. I'm going too fast. Okay, this two simplify. Yes, they're the same. So the sum is from j greater than q to n of the integral between 0 and 1 of t to the q derivative respect to xj of f in tx dt. And this is all just multiplied by this dx1 wedge dxq. And then you have this other uh, ugly term plus plus sum again. From j greater than q to n. I think here I missed an xj, sorry. Let's go back. Yeah, sorry, I missed this xj. Okay, and then we have the sum of the integral from zero to one of d to the q df dxj dx dx ah, dt dxj. So remember, this was like the coefficient of this. Wedge, this is a complicated thing. Sum from 1 to q, minus 1 to the i minus 1, xi dx1. And here we have to skip the xi component. Wedge, 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 dxq. OK, just wanted to rewrite it. OK, because now we have to sum these two and see that they're 0. Uh, but of course, uh, this part simplifies with this part. You see the coefficient is the same. Yeah. And this part simplifies. Oh, sorry, maybe I should have used a different color. Otherwise, it's pointless. And this part simplifies with this part. Because uh, observe that here we have negative 1 to the i, well, here we have negative 1 to the i minus 1. So this is actually one day inverse of each other. OK? And of course, here you have this condition in front. So what you're left with is f of x. Which is precisely what we wanted, because now you have a linear application k. I should take k compose d plus d compose k. Is just an entity. So you have f times dx1 which dx2. So the identity on q forms. Okay. So as we said before, as we said when we assume that k exists, we now conclude that for a star like domain, uh, the cohomology is trivial. Yeah, the zero cohomologies are or C no, so sorry, R, R. We're doing real the RAM for now. So we have this thing. So does that mean that um, the the complex, uh, it, it more or less means it has to be exact, right? Um, yeah, of the, precisely. Uh, the Beside, besides of the first step. Yeah, yeah, OK. So um, is that a, um, um, a strict limitation to the dimension of uh, each of the um, um, each of the modules? Um, each of the uh, steps in the complex, because um, so what? Uh, what do I want to say? Because I always thought that the uh, the each each step in the um, in the cohomological complex has a super big um, uh, vector Style. space. Yeah. So let's say the question here is something. Okay, so I have this complex. Yeah. 
and I know that okay, beside here it is exact. Mm -hmm. So let's say from from here on is exact, and maybe from here on is exact. Is the yeah. Problems, I guess. Does it tell me that that this have smaller dimension? But yes. dimension as what? As vector spaces? Uh, uh, first, uh, as I vector mean, spaces, yeah. As, as vector spaces over R? No, these are, these are huge. Um, ah, uh, is, is, is uh, Omega this Zero is already uh, super huge? Uh, I mean, this, this, is, uh, this is the same as uh, Symfinity over M, right? Yeah, 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 okay. So this is, then... I mean, as a vector space over R is insanely big. Yeah, yeah. Of course, as a, smooth, as a module over smooth functions, Okay. <laughs> then okay, it's just dimension generated. One. But <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, technically, I don't think you can speak about dimension from. Yeah, there is this this uh, sort yeah, of whatever. module dimension. <laughs> uh, okay. But whatever, and and this one, sure, there are modules and such are. I mean, this probably tells you that they're finally generated, but I don't think you need that. I think it's easier. Mm, okay. I mean, at least for open sets in. Mm. Uh, for open sets in uh, Rn. I think finitely mm. generated should not be hard to prove directly. Yeah. No, but uh, now everything is clear. I was just worried that we have only very few functions. Uh, no, and... no, yeah, we have a lot. <laughs> okay. yeah, we have a lot. <laughs> Good. Thank you. Okay. No, first. So the next theorem I want to talk about this is so called the uh, Meyer Vietoris sequence, which basically tells you if you have a set. Which is the union of two sets? How do cohomologies relate to each other? Uh, but before that, this is a small exercise. And is that if M is a manifold, and is the union of two open sets? I just wanted you to prove that if you just take the direct sum of the complexes with maps given just by the direct sum of the two differential maps on the two distinct open set, that this is a cohomological complex. Yeah, basically the, the sum of cohomological complexes is a cohomological complex. Okay. And why I want you to do this is because we have this theorem. Meyer Vietoris. That says, in fact, if we have a manifold, which is the union of two open sets, then the sequence of cohomological complexes, zero, p, alpha p, omega a p plus omega b p, beta p, omega p a intersected b. So here we're looking at the intersection where Alpha of omega is simply the pair, and beta is the difference restricted to a. So, I mean, technically, I should restrict them first and then take the difference, uh, but I'm pretty sure this is very understandable. Uh, this is a short exact sequence of cohomological complexes. This uh, short exact sequence of cohomological complexes. And uh, we know that we love uh, short exact sequences of cohomological complexes because this gives us a long exact sequence of cohomology by using this next lemma. So let's prove this theorem. You have to check the two things. So things to do, things to do. Uh, alpha, beta, morphisms. Yeah, easy. 
Nathan. Uh, they commute with the differential. Also done. Yeah, if you take a differential and then you restrict, or if you restrict and then you take a differential, already proved that this is um, the same. So, so that D is a local operator. Now, AP injective. Uh, also done. Yeah, uh, these are uh, these are morphisms. So you're just saying if this omega is zero in A and it's zero in B, then it's zero in M. Sure, because M is the union of A and B. Yeah, so the kernel is just one. Then we have to check that the kernel of beta P is precisely the image of alpha P. Uh, this is also uh, easy. Maybe okay. You have to use maybe something a bit more, uh, but this is also easy because the, if this is zero. Omega, why, why is this omega prime? Why is it omega prime? Yeah, sorry, mistakes. We should have two entries, right? Okay, because yeah, it's the sum. Uh, if you, I mean, if you're saying that this is zero, so kernel of beta p, you're saying that this is zero, then you're saying that omega is equal to omega prime on A intersected B. In particular, they glue to a section on A union B. And this section then is the one that gives you this image. Uh, vice versa, it's obvious because uh, if you have uh, something in the image here, it means that these are the same on the intersection because they come from the same function. So we're done. Yeah, that easy. Uh, while the fact that beta is surjective, this is maybe not so obvious. Surjective. So this is really the only thing to check. And we'll do it with partitional unity. So we take UA and you, uh, sorry, mu A, mu B, smooth functions on M. That's sum to one. And such that their supports are compactly contained in their respective open sets. Yeah. And now we take an omega in degree p on the intersection. Yeah. Because we're trying to prove surjectivity of beta. So we have to show that this can be expressed as a difference of two things that come one from A and one from B. And define mu A as, sorry, omega A as mu B times omega and omega B as a negative mu A times omega. Okay. And now you see that this looks weird. <laughs> Wait, okay. The omega A shouldn't it be the opposite? I mean, it's something stupid. They say here, did something stupid. This should be omega A, right? There's no way that this is the correct one. And here we're doing A minus B, so it should be. This makes more sense, maybe. Yeah? Now you see that omega a, you can just think of it as a form which is defined just on a, because the support is contained in a. No, I'm lying to you. I'm clearly lying to you. Sorry, I can do this. No, then then it was correct. So omega p here, omega here. Okay, we have to show that this is that this makes sense. So omega is defined only in the intersection. Uh -huh. Wait, wait, sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, I don't see this right now. I don't see it.
maybe we need this. But this is impossible, of course, this cannot happen. Mm -mm -mm. Aha, of course. Yeah, it's simply okay because this is simply because the support of uh, omega b is contained in b. So basically, on a, so then I have to ask something else. I don't need to ask that it's in B, I need to ask that it does not intersect A. So on A is just zero. So yeah. Hmm. Yeah, but then. Hmm. I will. Double check that one second. Uh, okay, first of all, one small lie is that this in principle is not necessarily compactly contained, just contained. But this is not the issue. The issue is why is this define, defines a form on A? I'm a bit uh, confused on this. Uh huh. Maybe, okay, maybe I have it. Yeah, it's basically just zero on A. Okay, I'm thinking it like this. You have A. You have B. And omega is defined in between. So here is well defined. Uh, but since the support of um, eta, B, eta B is contained in here, so it's something like this. You see that this this is for sure, like on. Uh, okay, okay, okay. So on. Uh, so so observation. So because on a minus b minus b omega a is identically zero. Yeah. Uh, sorry, why isn't it identical one? I thought omega a is contained in a, and they have to add up to one. Omega, yeah, but you see here we're multiplying multiplying times eta b, not by eta. Ah, uh, yeah, I'm I'm in the uh, in the uh, mu part. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah sorry, mu. Not... So okay, you take something which is support. So you take a partition unity. But then you don't like the omega a is not defined as mu a times uh, omega, but as mu b times omega. And now you mm. see that the support of this object. I mean, yeah, this, yeah, then this is for course. sure defined on a. This yeah, is, yeah. On a is well defined. And, and on uh, and b with it. And b is the same, no? It's the same. Yeah. But it should be zero uh, outside of a. That's what you want to say, right? Yeah. But OK. This support? No, the the uh, this one. Omega a should be zero oh. outside of b, or am I? Uh, yeah, exactly. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah. Then yeah. I'm following. <laughs> outside of b minus a, to be more precise, I think. No, that's a lie. That's a lie. No, you're correct. You're correct. Of course, you're correct. Just zero outside of B. And so we're sure that here it's just this is defined to be zero. Okay. Sorry. 
And now you see, okay, now if you take this omega and so if you take beta of omega a omega b, this is mu a plus mu b times omega. So just omega. Okay. Because the beta was defined as uh, omega minus omega prime. So when you take this difference, you get actually a sum, because this will be defined as minus eta mu a. OK, so to say it a bit more geometrically, you have something defined on the red part. And basically, what you want to do is just extend it to 0 here to have omega a, extend it to 0 here to have omega b, and then you're basically done. The problem is that you can't just extend to 0. You need to kind of smooth it out first. And this is what this omega, um, sorry, not omega, mu a and mu b are doing. They're kind of smoothing it out to 0. OK? Mm. Now I have to admit I'm not 100% sure, but is there always uh, such a partition with only two parts for each? Yeah, you just say, I mean, every open set as a, every sub over open covering as a thing like this, no? Yeah, okay, then I might have uh, <laughs> messed something up <laughs> in my head. Okay, good. Then it's okay. Yeah, it's the partition of unity. Every covering yeah. has a partition of unity. Uh, All right. It. Okay. Okay, so sorry. Now we get this out of the way. Uh, another small exercise here. Because, okay, we know. So I told you that this, is, this makes a cohomological complex. This was one exercise. But now we want to go to the uh, cohomology. So we have a short exact sequence in. Uh, of cohomological complexes, this gives by the snake's lemma a long exact sequence in cohomology. But what is the cohomology of this complex here? Okay, this is the cohomology of M, this is cohomology of A intersected B. But what is the cohomology of this? And it is what you expect, which is just the sum of the cohomology. So HP the RAM. Sorry, it's not the RAM, it's just the cohomology of the complex, whatever that is. So we proved, I mean, the exercise was to prove this is a complex, so you can take the cohomology, and the thing is that the cohomology is just the Durham cohomology, the sum of the Durham cohomologies. Okay, so the cohomologies of this as an abstract complex is just the sum of the cohomologies. And the corollary, the, which is what is called usually the Meyer Vietoris for the RAM. Uh, we have that this is a long exact sequence. HQ, the RAM intersected B, HQ plus one, the RAM M, HQ plus one A, plus HQ plus one B, the RAM, the RAM. Um, Q plus one, the intersected B, etc. Uh, is exact. And the proof we already say that no, it's the snake lemma, Meyer Vittori's theorem, and I guess these two exercises. So proof snake Meyer Vittori's exercises. Okay, one other 
very important thing that which then allow us to compute basically all kinds of homologies. So this is telling you, so my repertory is telling you how to build the homology of a large space from its components, basically. And okay, maybe just writing this, it's a bit stale in the sense that, okay, we know what the, this map is and we know what this map is because they're just induced maps. We don't know really what this map is. This is the one coming from the snake lemma. So if you really want to explore this a bit more, like if you want to use it on a concrete example, it would be kind of nice to really look at what this map really is. But we're not going to do that now. Uh, instead, I want to see how cohomology changes when you have homotopic maps. So what does that mean, first of all? So we take two manifolds. And we take two smooth maps between them. And we say that they are uh, infinity homotopic. Homotopic if they can be connected. So if there exists a big F from F from M times zero one into N small such that at time one we are at F and at time uh, sorry time zero we are at F and at time one we are at G. Okay. Have you seen this concept before? So, so uh, just um, in passant, I'm going to say that uh, uh, you can think of this as a path in the space of maps. So maybe mode observation, uh, you can think also F as a map from 0, 1 to the space of smooth maps between and from M to N. Yeah. Basically, for every fixed T, you have a map from M to N. And what you're saying is that F of zero is a prescribed map, so a prescribed point, and uh, F of one is another prescribed point in this space. Um, so already seen from this, you can see that talking about uh, things like the, um, the fundamental group of this space, is similar to talking about uh, homotopies in the between maps of the two spaces, something like this. And in fact, this is a very active thing. Uh, for instance, one very okay. Now I'm going a bit overboard, but uh, I hope it's interesting to you. Uh, you can think of if uh, M and N are um, complex manifolds. You can think that uh, the space of holomorphic maps in here is contained in here, right? And um, and yeah, there are many questions here. For, so you have an inclusion here, and in some cases, this inclusion is uh, what is called the homotopy equivalence. So I'm sure you saw uh, re retractions, for instance, when you studied the fundamental group. So this is some more fancy, I mean, it's not the same, uh, but it's very similar to saying that sometimes, like it's important to understand when this is a retract of this. And retract is not the right word, it's a homotopy equivalent. The inclusion is a homotopy equivalent. It's similar to being a retract, but not really. Okay. And this is precisely has to do when, uh, let's say you have two holomorphic maps, which can be connected through smooth maps can they actually be connected through holomorphic maps? Kind of thing. That, that, that's the big question, and it's the big question in uh, so-called OCA theory, uh, which is a big branch of complex analysis. OK, so digression. Uh, I wanted to mention this because this is uh, very close to what I do in my re daily research. And uh, okay, so why do we care about uh, homotopic maps? Well, the thing is that homotopic maps induced the same maps in cohomology. So what I mean, you have two manifolds, you have two maps which are homotopic to each other, homotopic. 
then their induced mapping homology are exactly the same map. So I repeat. So the thing is saying that this pullback doesn't care if two maps are homotopic to each other. Okay. So for the proof. Okay, we take uh, F, the homotopy. Homotopy between F and G. So what I mean, the homotopy between F and G, I mean this map here. It's a big map F, it's called the homotopy, the map connecting F and G. And now we take somehow what I want to call the evaluation map from M into M times R, or maybe M times zero one, uh, which simply takes X and send it to X comma J. And J is here only zero one. Okay, so we're either sending M to the base level or to the one level. Okay. And why I want to do this? Well, because I want to write uh, F and G as compositions. Because F now is small f is big F composed as zero. And uh, small g is big F composed as one. Right? Because the homotopy means that f of dot zero is f dot, right? So if you write this composition, this is precisely what you're writing. This is the same. Okay, so when you take the pullback, you know that uh, this inverts the direction. So basically, the only thing I want to prove is that so it is enough to prove that S0 and S1 are the same map as maps from uh, M times 0, 1, the cohomology of M times 0, 1 into the cohomology of just M. Right? That's all I need to prove. Because then if these are the same, then of course G and F stars are the same. Okay. Uh, so what are the relevant maps here? Well, we have pi for sure, uh, which sends M times R into just M. And this of course induces a pi star at the cohomology level. And what properties does it have? Well, we know that pi composed as j is the identity on m. m. Yeah, you go from m, you go to either x1 or x0, and then you just go back to x. So this is the identity. And in particular, sj star composed pi star is the identity. So this is identity in cohomology now. Okay. And in particular, this means that S0 star is the same as S1 star, not everywhere, but at least on the image on pi star. Yeah. So having a relationship like this basically tells you that pi is injective. Yeah, because this is the identity, so this must be injective and this must be surjective. And if you restrict yourself only on uh, the image of pi. This is a copy of the cohomology. Um, you have this equality, but only on the image. So we're left to prove. That the image is everything.
uh, sorry, I keep using R, this should have been zero, 01. Okay. Uh, which is basically the same at this point, the same that this pi is an isomorphism as well. Ah, sorry, it shouldn't be R, it should be zero, 01. Sometimes I use R, sometimes it's zero, 01. Okay. Yeah, you, you see, I mean, this this fact here proves that pi is pi star is injective, and then if you also show that it's surjective, then it's an isomorphism. Okay, so we're basically saying that this multiplying times zero one, which by the way is uh, um, star-like, doesn't do anything to the cohomologies. So to prove that this image uh, uh, is everything, so that the map pi star is surjective. We take omega tilde, the class of omega tilde, and this is a Derampi form on m times zero one. And in particular, what it means is that we can decompose it as omega t plus dt wedge omega t prime. And what are these? Well, omega t is a p form on m for fixed t, and t prime is a p minus one form on m. Uh, m for fixed t. So this is both for fixed <coughs> t. Okay. And um, now if we take the differential of this, we know it's zero because this is a representative for a Durham class. So in particular, it's a closed form. And what we want to get from here is some information about these other ones. Um, so when I write this differential here, what I mean is the differential in m times zero one. But if I write the differential of something that here depends from t, I only mean the differential in m for fixed t. So here, think that you're fixing t and taking, uh, um, so this is now a form on m and we take the differential on m. And then we later we remember this depends on t. Uh, okay, so you have this part, but then you also have to derive with respect to t. So this is what you get. And it might seem a bit weird that this dt comes on the left, but if you think about it in local coordinates, uh, uh, omega t is something of the form sum of ai, and this ai depends on t and x of the xi, where this i is a multi-index of length p. Yeah, so when you take the differential here, the, the good differential, so the, the, the one on, uh, so this is the differential on m times zero one of omega t. Okay, you have to derive each one of this. So you get a sum in i equal p, but also in small i. And here all you get, so okay, here the derivative respect to xi, and you get the xi wedge the x capital I. Uh, but then you also get the ones with respect to t. And you get dt wedge the xi, which here I'm basically rewriting like this. Yeah, so in local coordinates, this means this object here. So I'm simply derivating every, um, every term here, every factor by t. And um, here, what I mean is that, yeah, I forget that this depends on t and simply take this derivative, okay? So this is just to see what the, all this notation means and why when you take the derivative, it comes out like this. So let me delete it. Uh, and uh, okay, so this was for the first part. This was for uh, this, but then we have to derive this as well. And um, instead of a plus, you get a minus dt wedge d omega t prime. And I guess this d here is the same as this d here, d here, which is different than this d here. Okay. And uh, here you get the minus uh, uh, simply because when you when again when you have that uh, 
local expression, so this now this dt wedge omega t prime uh, actually looks like this. No, you have some bj, and now the length of j is smaller, is p minus one. Uh, here you get dt wedge dxj. Yeah, this is what I mean by this. So when you take the derivative here, okay, everything with t just disappears. Uh, but otherwise, when you take the derivative, uh, sorry, not d, but just omega t prime. Uh, what you get is the sum in j, but also in i, and you get the dj dxi dxi wedge dt wedge dx j multi index. Uh, so you see, if you want to bring the dt on the left, you have to put the negative one. Okay, so this goes to the right. Okay, so that's why we get this negative one. And in particular, in these two terms, a dt appears. Well, here it doesn't. So what this gives you is that the omega is zero, but more importantly for us, the omega t prime is derivative of omega respect to t. And um, what do we care about this? Well, let a tilde be the integral from zero to t of omega s prime ds. Now this is a p minus one form on m times r. Um, and what I mean by this, again, if you look in local coordinates, I simply mean that you're integrating each uh, bj, yeah, this was bj, each of them with respect to t. That's all I'm saying. And uh, then when you take the derivative, and again, this is the differential in m times 0, 1. I keep making this mistake. Um, Okay, when you derive with respect to the x coordinate, you just bring the derivative inside. So that's what you have. Uh, but when you derive with respect to the t coordinate, what you get is dt wedge omega prime t. Okay. Uh, but now we use this formula here. Because uh, it simply tells you that d omega t, d omega s prime in this case, is the derivative of here. So we use the fundamental theorem on calculus to get this omega t minus omega 0 plus dt wedge omega t prime. And in particular, this implies that the, um, the RAM class of omega 0 is the same as the, the RAM class of omega t plus dt uh, wedge omega t prime, which is nothing but the uh, class of omega prime. Another interesting thing is that this omega zero, okay, in principle, it's a form on m times zero one, but it's completely independent of t. So I can also think about it as a, a form on m, uh, which, and its image in particular, it's, uh, um, it's image by under p star, it's uh, precisely this omega tilde. Okay, so this I think more like, of, I can also think about it like this. Because this omega zero is independent of t, so I can also think about it as a form on uh, m. Okay. So this concludes uh, the proposition, and it concludes the lecture. I will see you uh, next time.